Uh, good afternoon to all of you, uh, to those of you who are from the University of Pretoria, and especially those from outside of UP. And I do see quite a number of people even from uh, my own church uh, on the platform. Thank you so much for joining us and do feel very welcome to this very special webinar. The Faculty of Theology and Religion is glad to host this, um, this webinar with the Transformation Office at UP. Uh, UP has an anti-discrimination policy which rejects all forms of discrimination. And every year we set aside a week to strongly promote anti-discrimination and, and social justice, which of, of course happens all through the year, but in this particular week, uh, there's a great more emphasis in terms of the entire university family and community focusing on anti-discrimination matters. So this week, 27th of September to the 1st of October, is the UP Anti-Discrimination Week with the theme, co-creating inclusive, affirming, and respectful spaces for all. Now the Faculty of Theology and Religion is conducting this webinar with the theme, old ways of being to new ways of seeing. And this obviously indicates the need for transformation uh, what we are, what we have been, and what we should become. In this webinar, we will reflect on the, anti, on the UP anti-discrimination policy and look at it from the perspective of faith-based discrimination. Now, some members of staff have produced short papers on various themes addressing different aspects of discrimination but they will not be presenting their papers in this particular webinar. Instead, what I will be doing is posing questions to them to help them unpack some of the things that they have said, but mainly to deliberate on certain themes as we talk about anti-discrimination. Now, to, altogether, we have eight participants responding to questions. And at the end, we will have about 40 minutes uh, for question and answers. So what I would like to recommend that you do is, if you have any questions, to place them on the chat as we go along. In the chat box, uh, Dana will be looking at some of these questions and trying to group them for us, and we'll pick them up later during the question and answer time. Now, two hours seem like a long time, but by the time we are done with this webinar, I am very certain that you would be wanting more. I think the topics that we are going to be tackling and addressing from a faith perspective, but also from anti-discrimination aspects is going to be quite uh, stimulating in the discussions itself. And looking at the presentations in terms of the questions that we have worked on, I think we virtually leave uh, no stone unturned. Uh, obviously there might be some things missing, but we have tried to as much as possible focus on most, if not all, of those issues from a faith perspective that concerns anti-discrimination. So I'd like to just as a way of rules, just to simply say, I know most of us are all zoomed out by now. We know how these devices and platform works, but just to say, if you can put your video off and your, and your speaker muted, if you're not talking, uh, participants will uh, unmute and put on the video when they're responding to questions. So let's move on. Now, I'm sure you would agree with me that racial discrimination has been and continues to be a serious problem in South Africa and even across the globe, as we see so many racial divides and conflicts and divisions and troubles in different parts of the world. Uh, and it lingers. And even though we have come from the apartheid experience, racism is still very prevalent, even in the South African context. Now the black theology of liberation or black liberation theology over the years has made very significant contributions to challenges uh, in terms of racial discrimination. And uh, with us today, one of our staff members is Dr. Shul Shulani Mdingi, who is in the Department of uh, Systematic and Historical Theology. And he has been doing some work on the issue of black theology and black theology of liberation in particular, as we understand it today. And so I want to pose a couple of questions to him to get the ball rolling because this is a focus on racism itself. Now, Shulani, I, I just want to say that 
not many people may be acquainted with what uh, Black Theology of Liberation is all about. In a nutshell, just within maybe a minute or two, if you could just tell what this is all about. If somebody asked you, what is Black Theology of Liberation, what would you say? Well, um, thank you, Prof, uh, for this platform. First and foremost, I think it would be very important to say that Black theology emerged out of the Black Power Movement, which means that it was an attempt to legitimize or get a sense of sovereignty or some kind of legitimate place for Black people in the world in general. So uh, for that reason, it is, a, it is a kind of theology that deals with addressing the questions of the dehumanized, in particular because of race. Uh, it is also a theology that deals with the questions of justice, how do we go about to build societies, because in its foundational phases, and even I think today, uh, it has always been anti-white, but purely pro-black, which does not mean that we, we negate uh, the participation of whites or so forth, but we're saying, let us look at the reality of the world that we live in and the kind of geographical locations that we find ourselves in and find out who are the ones who are mostly oppressed and so forth. And those are major themes that you find in Black liberation theology. It's an understanding that God is on the side of the oppressed. And in this case, if the oppressed are Black, God is on the side of Black people. Thank you. That's a very, very good synopsis in terms of uh, defining black theology of liberation. But also, as you spoke about the issue of blackness and whiteness, uh, black theology of liberation does not focus exclusively on these issues of color and pigmentation. But you mentioned the issue of the poor and the oppressed. So it's much broader than we think yes. uh, and not specified in terms of color, right? Yes. yes, it is true, Prof. Um, well, I wasn't sure how much time I have, but I think it's also critical to understand what it means by Black. Uh, if you are able to understand that, then automatically you will begin to understand. Like, for instance, in the South African context, uh, Black theology was sort of like a, an armed soldier for the Black consciousness movement. Even the conceptualization of Blackness within the Black consciousness framework does not necessarily fall into purely pigmental kind of politics but it is much broader to that. It's a form of new humanism for those who find themselves crushed and so forth. And Cohen has even, even pushed it further that there are physiological inclinations to it, but there are also ontological aspects to it. So it, it's, it doesn't sort of, it's sort of like a joke that not everybody who's black who does theology is a black theologian. There has to be some kind of ideological leaning that you actually subscribe to, to be a black theologian. Now that, that's a very significant point you actually made. Not everybody who is black does black theology because there's a lot of people who are not black who are doing black theology and are classified themselves and happy to do so as black theologians because that actually indicates a broad spectrum in terms of how we actually understand black theology. So it's more in terms of the ideology, but more particularly dealing with systems of oppression uh, and particularly oppression on the basis of race. But, but could, you, could you just tell me briefly, uh, how does a black theology of liberation help us to address the issues of discrimination based on race? Well, first and foremost, the, 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 the most important thing that black theology wishes to dispel is the notion that there are other human beings who are better than others. Uh, black theology seems to affirm Imago Dei, the brotherhood of all humanity, uh, as first and foremost, a fundamental tenant within Christian theology, but a fundamental view of accepting God as creator as well as accepting him as savior at the, at the same moment. So you, you, you have that which has to be affirmed because the system of apartheid, white supremacy and so forth operated from the premise that anybody who's pigmented in particular uh, is not a human being, is not this and this. So black theology attempts by all means to sort of prove that to be false but above that to prove it that it is unchristian in the first place. So no, in that's, that that's way, then, yeah, then in that go way, ahead, go we ahead. Are, in, in that way, we're able then to see that it is highly impossible, particularly within the, the confines of faith, to have a discrimination against other human beings if we do affirm the same creator and if we do affirm the same narrative in terms of us being the pinnacle of God's creation. There's a brotherhood, there's a sisterhood across lives. So now I really like the way you pin this theologically because you're actually pointing out God as creator of all human beings. And, and in terms of dealing with this from a race point of view, no, no particular race stands out or becomes superior in the process of understanding uh, human dignity. 
human dignity is actually assigned to every single person, all created in the image of God. And, and you're saying that black theology does that for us because the focus is not so much on color because sometimes people misunderstand that. They think it is about blackness and exclusive blackness, but it's not just about blackness. Of course, in South Africa, the majority of people who have actually been disadvantaged and who have suffered under apartheid are black. And therefore it takes dimensions in terms of working with blackness. But yes. the actual focus is on human value, human dignity, the human being and human person. Right? Yes. 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 Now, now, how would you respond to somebody? Because I know today we live in a, in a new South Africa and a lot of uh, black leadership is in place in politics and in other spheres of, uh, of life and careers and ambition and choices. And some people say, but you know, we probably don't need black theology anymore because uh, the South African context has changed. So what would well, you say to somebody who actually says that? Well, first and foremost, I think with regards to black theology, it never really pinpointed racism only purely on the edge of few individuals. It understood it from a systemic point of view. Now, the logical question that comes from that is that, do we still have those systems in place? And in, 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 in most instances, we find out that we still have the kind of red tape where certain groups of people in society are not allowed certain things or are not allowed to have certain access to those things. So within that context and understanding within the whole framework of Western domination and so forth, black theology becomes absolutely valuable and relevant because the systems have not changed. And ultimately, even with these uh, platforms, the attempt is to try and to deal with these systematic issues that whereas you might have a pigmented face in positions of office, it does not necessarily mean that the system itself has changed. We have to work very hard in terms of changing that particular system. And that is where black theology comes in. And, and, and of course, we join solidarity with other uh, liberation theology uh, theologies that deal, for instance, with the questions of women, the questions of gender, and so forth. So we're dealing really at the core with systematic issues. And if we are able to understand black liberation theology from those premise or from that particular premise, then we understand why it is valuable today. Absolutely. So what you're saying is systemic change is still necessary. And yes. as long as those things remain with us, black theology is always going to be necessary. And, yes. I, and, and absolutely, I mean, because systemic change in terms of economics and in terms of well, politics might have had a change, but what about economics and power sharing yes. and power dealing? Because it's all about power as well, right? Uh, yes. Thank you so much for this insight. I think you've actually helped us to already plant the idea of, of discrimination based on race. And you've shown us what black theology uh, as, as, as is continuing to do in this and has taught us so much that we still need to learn from as time would allow for us. I want to shift my focus now to, to the next participant, uh, Professor Ernest van Eck, who is the HOD, the head of department of the New Testament uh, and, and, and related scripture department. And he's also the deputy dean of the faculty. Um, and he's also been doing some work with regards to race. Uh, but he seems to take a little bit of a different position with regards to understanding the broadness of race. But before we get to the broadness of race, Ennis, I'd like to pose the question to you. You seem to think that ethnicity is probably a bigger issue than race. Uh, I wonder if you could just explain that to us briefly. Uh, 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 Dean, thank you. Thank you for the question. My, my answer to this question uh, uh, links uh, directly to what uh, Shalana just said about black theology not only being about blackness, it's also about human dignity. Now, um, in, my, in, my, in my little bit of work on, on, on ethnicity and race, that I've come to realize that uh, in, in, in the study by anthropologists, when they look at the differences between groups, it's common for them to use the term race, but then understood specifically as physical appearance, appearance to indicate the difference between groups. Now, this, this, this theory of race, some people visit like that. Many biologists and anthropologists, they argue this is pseudoscience simply because of its lack of scientific capability. If you look, for example, at immigrants, for example, in cities, they often make up different groups based on not only physical appearance, but based on language, land of birth, customs, religion and diet, and not solely on 
the basis of differences in physical appearance. Now, uh, I'll say a bit more about this a bit later, but before the 1800s, group differentiation or group identity was based on cultural ethnicity. Now, groups use their ethnicity to define and delineate themselves as unique. And ethnicity was determined by characteristics like family, name, language, land of birth, um, message, common, interest, common ancestry, uh, customs, shared historical memories, and religion, and one of the aspects were uh, phenotypical features. Therefore, my argument is uh, to use cultural ethnicity to differentiate between groups. I believe it's a more balanced approach since it focuses holistically on the differences between people and not only on one aspect, namely phenotypical appearances or color. So this, this is why I say, sorry, Dean. This, this is why I argue uh, when we when we when we try to, to to delineate between groups of people, the focus should not be race as it's being used nowadays, but it should be cultural ethnicity. So, so you then take a broader perspective in terms of race, and 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 sort of explain a modern concept to it. Mm, yeah. So, how would you imagine that this broadened understanding of race? And the concept that you actually have been discussing and, and pointing out more particularly related to issues of ethnicity, how would you actually uh, use this broad definition of race uh, to tell us about how we should respond to racial discrimination? Now, if I if if I can just go back for a minute into history uh, uh, to use the term race as a way as a way of differentiating between groups uh, is modern. It's, it's a very modern concept since. The word race actually only uh, came into use in the 18th century. Originally, during the Middle Ages, for example, the notion exists, existed that there were, there were three distinguishable peoples according to the three sons of Noah, like the Semites, the Hamites, and the Yephetites. Uh, that's now Shem, Ham, and Yafet. But during the 17th, 16th century, the term race in the beginning was used to refer only to descent and gradually came to include factors such, such as phys physical characteristics, culture, or even nationality. And then in the 18th century, which I say, let's say in this, in, in this, in, in, in this argument, the modern period, we saw the development of the theory of biological evolution, which proceeded from the presumption that different species of homo sapiens could be distinguished from each other by paying attention to differences in people's physical appearance, which would have been developed in certain isolated areas. Now, the result of this theory was the well-known threefold racial typology, the monogloids, the negroids, and the Caucasians. And then because of this differentiation in the European, in the Euro-American and Euro-African context, this distinction implied the superiority of Caucasians and in many cases became the root of racism. Therefore, people based on their physical appearance are discriminated against, as it is in the case of sexual orientation, for example. Now, my argument is this. This focus or theory of race has not led, not only led to unwanted discrimination, but also to the under-evaluation of the richness that lies in ethnic differences. Discrimination has taken the place of the celebration and embracing of ethnic and cultural differences because of a modern and a reductionist understanding of identity in terms of race and race only, meaning phenotypical characteristics. We should rather celebrate our differences than discriminating because of our differences. So my argument so that's very is interesting. Yes. That's very interesting because I think you've actually quite well uh, defined what you mean by ethnic uh, approaches yeah. to understanding race and given a broader definition of race. But I think as you as you would always uh, imagine so, is that by the end of the day, it always, in terms of even talking about South African racism and, and the context that we've experienced under apartheid, that much of what we think in terms of our race has been largely aligned to physical looks, appearances, and and even culture and language and so forth. So that's how it actually uh, broadens the entire picture in terms of understanding what racism is all about. But but 
you as a New Testament scholar, I, I mean, you know, uh, and a good scholar in the New Testament field, uh, would also uh, uh, admit that some of the problems that we face today are not unique to us because cultural diversity, racial diversity, or not even race, to use the word race then, but differences of communities did also appear in the New Testament times. So if you could just briefly tell us how Paul, for example, the apostle, addressed ethnic differences in early, early Christianity, and how this can be used to overcome racial categories and to create a new social and culture identity at UP, or even in South Africa. Now, 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 now the interesting thing uh, is in, in some of Paul's congregations, uh, there were conflict between Jews and non-Jews. We should actually say Judeans and non-Judeans, but let's say Jews and non-Jews. Now, the interesting thing is that in, this, in these conflicts, phenotypical appearances like skin color was not an issue, but there were other things that were an issue that we sometimes think are religious, are religious issues. But recent Pauline stu studies has indicated that, for example, if you say someone must be circumcised, someone must keep the kashrut rules or the purity rules, that these issues are not religious issues, but rather these are ethnic issues. And therefore, if there was conflict in the Pauline congregations in terms of, because of circumcision or not circumcision, keeping the, law, the, the, the dietary laws, not keeping the dietary laws, it was not a religious conflict, but, but it was actually, in essence, an ethnic conflict, or let's say ethnic discrimination. Uh, in terms of this understanding of the Pauline literature, the call or demand to be circumcised, therefore, was not a case of one can only be a child of God if one is circumcised, but rather you first have to become a Jew because circumcision was an ethnic marker, the ethnic marker of Judaism. So you first have to become a Jew before you can, you can be a child of God. In other words, discrimination does that not take place on the basis of faith, but on the basis of ethnic differences. This is why I say ethnic, uh, to, to, to distinguish between people in terms of cultural uh, uh, ethnics is more appropriate. Now, how did Paul react to this discrimination or to these conflicts? Now, I'm only going to use Philippians as an example. Now, in Philippians, Paul makes use of his, interestingly, his own ethnicity, which he calls things of the flesh. Such a wonderful, wonderful thing to say, ethnicity are things of the flesh, to resolve this conflict by first stating in Philippians 3 to 4 to 6, he says, though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has a reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Now, now see how Paul lists all the ethnic markers. Circumcised on the eighth day, I'm of the people of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, in other words, he's a super Jew, Hebrew of the Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. In other words, he says, you have ethnic markers, I also have them. And then he says, by stating the following, he says, these things are are things of the flesh. There are things which he, he says, these are the things I previously regarded as, want, as, as an advantage, but now it's a loss and it should be rejectable. These things, Paul says, should not create conflict between people or make one group discriminating against another group because they think they are superior. These are things of the flesh and not of the spirit. And when in Christ, the only aspect that all believers share these, these differences do not matter. And therefore, I believe at UP, for example, we must take the same approach. Embrace our differences, embrace our ethnic differences, identify in what we share, what Shazani just talk, spoke about earlier, our humanness, our values, our vision of this university, and then focus on that to create our own kind of cultural or social uh, identity. One can even say like a common kind of ethnic identity in which we all share. Right, so that's very interesting because I think the way to actually approach this matter of racism is to actually get out of our selected uh, cocoons 
and comfort zones in terms of our own particular ethnic uh, uh, foundations and see the broader picture in terms of looking at people as people, as God's creation, created in the image of God. And that actually helps us to deal with racism and racist, racist tendencies that, that are within us as we, as we, as Mandela said, you know, we're not born with it, but we grow into it. And I think that's the reality of where it is. So thank you for sharing with us those thank perspectives, you. even from the, from the New Testament. But I want to dig a little deeper into this by going to our next participant, uh, Dr. Zoro Dube, who is also uh, um, a senior lecturer in the Department of New Testament and the related and related scriptures, uh, related literature. And, and he goes a little bit deeper in terms of not just looking at race, but zero in on certain aspects. And he adds to this, uh, not only just the issue of ethnicity, but gender and class as well. And uh, he's going to tell you just now what he focuses as a priority when actually trying to understand these issues of discrimination and how we can overcome it. But uh, Dr. Dubey, I'd like to put this question to you. Uh, uh, in, your, in your presentation, which I read and many people have not read who are on this platform, you seem to talk quite a bit about lessons that one can learn from the Syrophoenician women uh, in relation to discrimination. Could you just elaborate a little bit and tell, tell us on this platform uh, some of those lessons that one can learn from that story? Uh, thank you, Dean, and thank you for all the panelists and all the listeners. Um, I think this morning or this afternoon, actually, when <laughs> still in the morning, we are discussing a, a very uh, important topic, and not only very important, but I think for me, it's fr from listening so far to the previous uh, two speakers, it's a complex discussion, it's really a complex discussion. And the story of the zero Phoenician woman makes it more complex because it, it allows us to ruminate on two things. Number one, that we discriminate every day. And, and, and I think the previous speaker has pointed it out that ethnicity is how society categorizes itself either through the way we talk, uh, intonation, through the way we dress. And therefore, in a way, I think, I think uh, Chair, we need to ruminate on that aspect first, that, that discrimination is part of how human being organizes itself every day. Either we, we want to say it is bad or it is good, but it is a sense in which humanity uh, categorizes itself in a certain sense. So in, in, my, in my view, I think the story of the Phoenician woman talks about discrimination as a daily practice because this woman from Tyre or Sidon met Jesus and he was asking for a legitimate request, which was the healing of her daughter. And Jesus used ethnicity to say, I can't heal you because I am a folk healer from Palestine and my healing practice, I only do it in Jerusalem. And, and, and therefore there is a way in which we do uh, prejudice or a subjective discrimination every day. So that one, we should be clear about it. Secondly, I think what is more important to the discussion this morning is, is that sometimes we confront the way we discriminate things and the way we discriminate people. And therefore, the discrimination of people or of persons is what is of an issue today. And I think the two speakers have made us to think about why and who does the discrimination. And it is not, it is not, it is not the person who lacks privilege who does the discrimination, but rather in the sense or in the story of the Syrophoenician woman, it is the man who has privilege. He's a man, he's a healer, so he has something that the woman wants. So privilege is one, it's, it's, it's one of the aspects, uh, sorry, <clears throat> one of the aspects from which discrimination comes from. But also we have to ask the question on that second point to say, why do we discriminate? Normally we discriminate because we want to preserve legacy, 
we want to preserve privilege, we want to preserve identity, and we want to preserve our, our status. So there is a sense in which society has a way from this story that I've indicated, um, pushes others out either through policy uh, in the sense of apartheid and the colonialism and all the daily practices that we see in institutional discrimination or subjective discrimination, which we see in, in ethnicity. I think uh, the wonderful point that actually emerges out of that is the issue that we, the discrimination aspect is so strongly deeply related to the fact that we want to preserve our identity. Yes. And generally yes. where identity is in question or in crisis, guess what? The reaction is to actually oppress, react and discriminate. And I think your point is very good in that. But one of the things that you've actually focused on is um, um, on, on people should look at my need and not mm. my other aspects that are part of my life. So not my color, not my looks, not my, uh, my culture, but my need. What are my needs? And when we look at needs, then we can be able to respond to people in more value-centered ways and human uh, appreciations in terms mm. of who people are. So I want to put this question to you. Why can one argue that the, um, uh, sorry, would you say that the church, society, institutions tend to reflect and respond to the person's need or does the factors of ethnic background, gender and class also come into play? What has been your experience in this? Um, thank you, thank you so much. And I think, I think, like I said at the beginning, we, we are talking a very complex issue from a very surface, from a very surface point of view. Um, and I think I needed to emphasize this uh, that discrimination is embedded in power. And I think if we miss that point, discrimination is embedded in power. If we talk about the discrimination of people, not discrimination of objects. Yeah. So to the question that um, how does society or, or, or a church uh, focuses need instead of discrimination or, or instead of gender plus um, and, and, and all the other aspects of which, which we have mentioned, I think is to, is to, is to assume um, that that there is a prescription to the problem. So, so, so chair, I, I need I need I need to emphasize this point that that um, I, I needed to use Abreu Massey's explanation where he differentiates between a mystery and a problem. A problem, according to Massey, is something that we can use techniques. We can use a formula. We can use a prescription. We can use a drug. That's a problem because we need to tackle a problem that is outside there. So your question, Chair, seems to suggest or to imply the hearers that we are dealing with a problem in which the church or the faculty of theology where we reside can offer a, a solution to. Is, is discrimination a problem? Uh, can we offer a solution to it? Or according to Gabriel Massey, it is a mystery, because according to Gabriel Massey, a mystery is an issue in which the interlocutor or the, the one who is asking is also equally part of the problem. So I think that is where we are in the Faculty of Theology or as a, so as a society as a whole, that we are dealing with a mystery where the church, the society should own up to say, when we ask the question of discrimination, the subject or the interlocutor is not outside the problem. So, 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 so the one who is asking and say, um, I, I, I'm not, I want to, I don't want to, I don't want legacy or I don't want the privilege, or I don't want identity, or I don't want the status. These are internal subjective things that everybody inherently want. Patriarchy, masculinity, ethnicity, racism, are all embedded in what, in what Habroma said, we call mystery. 
So, so to me, I think we are dealing with a very complex issue to say, how can the church, in other words, that is how I can frame this chat, to say, how can the church own up its own participation in those subjectivities, either subjectivities of what, which were done through apartheid, subjectivities of colonialism, subjectivities of gender discrimination, subjectivities, as one of the speakers has already mentioned, of economic disparity. Because, because if we are talking about legacy, status, and all these things, we are implicitly part of framing the whole concept of discrimination. Um, but to me- I think yes, no, absolutely. Is, I think, I mean, it, yeah. it's either the problem or the mystery, and the problem is that we are the problem as well. And I think that we requires are, we are, we are, we are, a we certain, are, yeah. a great deal of, of navel gazing before we even talk out. And I think that's- yeah. Probably yeah, yeah. very true of the church, but I yeah. want to take you to another question in, in in just rounding up this particular contribution, and that is the UP community is a very diverse uh, community in terms of race, language, culture, religion, gender, and even economics. How can the focus on needs, which you specify, help us to overcome discrimination? Oh, yes, yes, um, that's a good question, Chair, and I think the question. Also, um, I mean, uh, pulls back the whole question of a mystery and a problem. Has, 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 we, we can rephrase it by saying that has UP ruminated uh, on social problems, or is UP part of solving or owning up social problems, or it is an, an aloof institution? Are we participating? Into the into the whole, so we can we can raise the whole issue of common humanity. We can raise the whole issue of uh, of participation. So to deal with a need, to go back to the question that we are dealing with a mystery, and if we are dealing with a mystery, I am subjectively subjectively involved in the creation of the problem, and therefore I need to participate. In that problem and and the participation means owning up moving out of my comfort zone and embracing the pain of the other embracing the the, the issues that the other is facing and therefore when we look in nst terms what we are talking about is that in our curriculum has has up managed to ruminate on the issue of gender violence, if you are talking about gender violence outside. Has it ruminated on the question of uh, um, racism, which, which we have talked about, the issues of ethnicity, which you have talked about, issues of economic disparity? Is, are, we, are we close to the problem in terms of our participation? Or the way that I can use is instead of participation is empathetic education yeah. is our education empathetic in answering in our in our curriculum uh, those needs that we are talking about um thank you dr Duby. i think that's absolutely fantastic because i think in, in a nutshell i think even addressing the issue of pain what you have said is that the way we can overcome discrimination is to learn to embrace another's pain indeed, and indeed. i think if we learn to do that that will also speak to us and that aspect of empathy is so crucial in terms of behavioral patterns and how we learn not to discriminate against others. Thank you very much for that. I want to zero in now a little bit more deeper into the, the, the conversation on discrimination. And this time uh, we know that women have always been subjected to serious and severe discrimination. Uh, discrimination in the, in the church and religious organizations and bodies, discrimination in the workplace, discrimination in the home context, even the use of culture, all of these things are just so powerful in terms of women being discriminated at. And I want to introduce now Dr. Tanya van Veik, who is a senior lecturer in the Department of Systematic and Historical Theology. And I'd like to pose a few questions with her as we just zero in onto the conversation about women and discrimination. So Tanya, Tanya, before what you get into your questions, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just thought this would be a nice transition point in which to mention for those of you who aren't monitoring the chat function, we all know 
that questions for individual speakers are being posed there that we'll take up later on in the meeting. But there's also uh, some really fantastic feedback on the different points that are made by the different presenters. So I'd like to encourage everyone by clicking on the chat function at the bottom of the screen to look at the written running comments. These aren't questions that we're going to take up per se because they're more thoughts on what's being said and not necessarily questions. So take a moment if you can to check out the comments there as they come through. I found them very important and inspiring. And without further ado, we'll get to uh, Dr. Van Vig. Thank you, Prof. Yes, we'll pick up the questions and comments a little later. And we're gonna have hopefully ample time for that because I'd really like us to get into a robust discussion if that's possible as well. So Dr. Van Vig, uh, uh, what is the role of religion in general when it comes to women discrimination and anti-discrimination? Thank you, Dean Pile, and thank you for the audience as well. I think this is such a wonderful opportunity to be able to engage in these matters and hopefully uh, create a real safe space and a constructive one for some, some dialogue. So thank you so much for the question to open up the field. So I think, um, Summer, in summary, and generally speaking, religion has got this very interesting and maybe in a way a scary a paradoxical nature and ability, namely that religion is both perpetrator and liberator when it comes to the role of women and uh, discrimination and anti-discrimination. And because this session this afternoon is specifically focused on commenting on UP's anti-discrimination framework and policy, I think one of the main things when it comes to religion and its perpetrator uh, nature um, and how it's complicit in that regard really relates to uh, the notion and the phenomenon of sexism. Um, in that regard, sexism um, is really uh, perpetrated and uh, perpetuated and in many cases, unfortunately, facilitated by uh, religion. And specifically when it comes to sexism as a type of a discrimination and a prejudice based on, on gender, which applies, of course, to all gender. But I really want to focus on, on women this afternoon in the short time I have, because um, it seems almost as if women's issues sometimes get to the bottom of the conversation, because it almost seems as if it's something that's been dealt with. Um, so I, I, when I speak about gender this afternoon, I'm going to focus mostly on women. So when it comes to uh, the perpetrator aspects of religion in general uh, related to sexism and discrimination, there are three forms of sexism that is really um, linked to, to one another. And religion specifically, I think, is unfortunately guilty of the second type, which is uh, called benevolent sexism. Um, hostile sexism is the first type, and that's easy to spot because it's open hostility towards women and it's easy to spot and it's outright uh, prejudice and discrimination. But benevolent sexism is something that's a little bit more insidious, um, unfortunately. And it relates to uh, attitudes towards women that might be seemingly positive, some expressions that's made. For example, women are natural caregivers. Uh, women deserve men's protection. Women should be put on a pedestal. Those things seemingly sound very positive, but it's a benevolent type of sexism, I think, which is prevalent in religion which of course leads to the last type of uh, sexism, which is internalized sexism, which is when it affects women's self-esteem and how women view and treat each other. So that's on the negative side. On the positive side, religion as a liberator, and my co colleague Lulani has referred to this, if I can specifically speak from the Christian religion's perspective, um, Christian religion and religion does have this wonderful capacity for religious language, uh, religious foundation, um, uh, to be a vehicle uh, to recognize human dignity and therefore um, uh, promote and uh, emphasize human rights. And, and that is where the liberator aspect of religion can play an immense role in religious communities. Um, and of course, those things are then exacerbated by other factors. But in general, uh, Dean Pillay, those are the two general aspects religion um, can play and unfortunately negative side sometimes do. No, I mean, you're absolutely correct. I mean, in terms of even the Christian religion, uh, we know our different churches, uh, different church denominations uh, have different views about women and women in leadership and so forth and the role that women play. I mean, religious bodies have been guilty uh, in many ways of how women have been uh, not respected 
in positions of leadership and not recognized uh, in terms of the leadership and ministry they have to offer, which is also God-given gifts given to women to the church and through the church. And I, I know that in your paper, you spoke about a non-binary approach uh, when addressing gender discrimination. I'd like you very briefly to just describe what you mean by that and then tell us how such an approach can help us to prevent discrimination. Yes, in, in my research and in my daily practice and listening to the stories of so many women being part of a Christian denomination, um, the whole aspect of how we think about um, binary gender roles is quite prevalent. So to answer your question and say what a non-binary approach is, I just briefly want to say what a binary approach would entail. And of course, binary um, constitutes this framework where one speaks either or categories or absolute opposites. And from a Christian religious perspective, which is the one I'm qualified to speak about, this manifests um, as the justification of constructed gender roles and specifically gender norms, uh, which often makes use of our creation narratives, for example, in the Genesis text. And it's an interpretation of that text that is generally uh, persistently perpetuated, um, that there are two types of human beings and a man and a woman, and a woman is inferior version of a man. Now, this whole framework of lead, of course, leads to what I call the three H's, which is heteronormativity, uh, hegemony, and of course, um, as well, um, hierarchy. And those three things lead to violence in the end. And, and um, therefore, an, a non-binary approach is necessary to protest this and to mitigate it. And the way that a non-binary approach would function is basically, I think, on two roles. Number one, to expose uh, the problematic nature of constructing uh, gender roles and attributing to gender norms. Uh, and the problem uh, uh, to, to, to really expose this and the problematic around it means uh, looking at the question about uh, who is allowed to speak and about what. Because once one puts in place these type of binary roles, it's very much about there's a space for you to speak, of course, but of course there's certain presuppositions and uh, caveats linked to that open space. So is that space really as open as if it purports to be? And a non-binary approach tries to say that uh, linking certain roles and values and job descriptions and uh, human worth to one's gender is inherently dangerous. And a non-binary approach in that regard, if we can work in our communities to work towards a non-binary which does not pit genders as absolute opposites links to what they are allowed to do and what they are allowed to say and where they are allowed to say it. Um, such an approach can go a long way, I think, to, to work against discrimination and to foster a truly uh, inclusive space. I, I think that's what I will say for now and just see uh, how we can talk a little bit further about that. Thanks, Dean. Thank you, that's very helpful. I think the idea of the binary and non-binary is actually quite, quite relevant in the conversation of of looking at gender issues. And I think you've actually outlined that very nicely. But I mean, for ages, we have used the binary approach to keep women excluded and captivated in terms of limitations. Uh, but, but given all of that circumstances, and I know we haven't had enough time to explore it more deeply, but what role can you say the faculty, the church, the university can play in terms of addressing the issues of equality and exclusion of women? Thanks, Dean. Um, yes, it's such a pity that we don't have uh, more time um, to, to really go into these things. But I think um, briefly looking at our faculty and faculties of theology and religion across the country, I think the, the aspect that really jumps out immediately is the fact that the leadership of these faculties are, um, if not exclusively, but mostly um, compromised of, of male leadership. So when it comes to asking the question what the role is the faculties can play, it seems to me almost like considering the composition of leadership and the influence that leadership has, that it's actually quite clear where the power lies to change or to uh, maintain the status quo. 
Um, and I think that is something that really needs to be taken um, in a little bit more discussion. And uh, But from a leadership perspective, the ability to influence and to change is there or to keep intact. And I think that is across um, faculties in our country and, of course, also related to historical ways the faculties were constituted, et cetera. And when it comes to more practical things, Dean, I really actually, um, I made a list when I started thinking about these things because it's one thing to talk about this in an abstract way, but if one says it's clear where the power lies to perpetuate or to change, the practicalities come for me towards that leadership in, in this regard and, and the faculty culture, as it were, um, should lead by example. And get involved in conversations and empower women, don't underestimate them. Um, sometimes please also, which happens a lot, unfortunately don't patronize them. Um, and, and in terms of, of what is happening in terms of faculties uh, across the country, I think one of the role would be is just to uh, allow uh, women scholars to speak, prescribe the work of female theologians, for example, and these are things that are not that hard to achieve and can be achieved really uh, relatively easily. Um, but I think creates opportunities to empower. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I can talk about this for quite a while, but I think those are some of the core aspects. I think is something that is a faculty of theology and religion, which has a really strong voice in society should be able to, to play. Thank you so much for some very practical uh, ideas in terms of what one must do. And this is also applicable on a broader scale in terms of different organizations. Thank you so much for that input. I want to shift gear a little bit now and go to uh, Professor Jakubeus, who is the head of Department of uh, Religion Studies. And he's been doing some work with regards to uh, sexual orientations and particularly aspects of how people are treated and discriminated against with regards to sexual orientations. Um, Professor Baez, if I could just put this question to you. In some faith religious communities, LGBTQ plus uh, are simply not accepted or tolerated. Why would you say this is the case? Let me just unmute myself. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, it's, a, it's a short question, which I suspect has a longer answer. And uh, there might be many reasons, just to answer your question, there might be many, many reasons why uh, religious communities uh, would not accept or tolerate uh, people from different uh, sexual orientations. I think uh, one of the main reasons might be ethics. Now, if we just consider for a moment the very nature of religion, we realize religion consists of uh, beliefs, uh, practices, but just as much as uh, it consists of ethics. And uh, religions, I think, uh, consider themselves as the protectors and guardians of certain ethics. And these ethics might be specific to a particular religious community. So when they consider the way in which they understand human existence, these ethics come into play. Now, um, I, I suspect uh, one of the reasons might be that religions consider the way in which the natural order is arranged. And the natural order might be very specific to a, a religious understanding. So each religion might have its own understanding what is uh, meant with natural order. And the moment there is a deviation from this perceived natural order, it is uh, considered to be unnatural, unacceptable, and intolerable. So first of all, it's the natural order thing that I think religions uh, 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 cause them to be intolerant to its uh, other sexual orientations. But secondly, there's also this whole matter that I think religions, uh, whether it is society that assigns them with this task, or whether religions claim this task, uh, it appears as if many religions uh, claim uh, and or accept the task of being the guardians of a social order. So it's not only a natural order, but also now a social order that religions perceive themselves to be the protectors of. And in the social order, religious communities might consider, but what is acceptable within our social order? And the moment when it becomes opposing a natural social order, religious communities might oppose such uh, deviations. A third important reason, I think, is the whole matter of uh, fundamentalism. Uh, perhaps I should just say mm. something about the, the background as to fundamentalism. Uh, I think um, fundamentalism is a method as well as an ideology. 
Now, if we talk, uh, at first I started off of, by talking about ethics on uh, natural orders and social orders, but what we do, uh, religious communities get these ideas and, and all of these ideas are substantiated and uh, sanctioned in sacred texts. So the moment the religious uh, community want to ask themselves, but all right, so what should the natural order or social order look like? It's substantiated in a sacred text. But the way in which these sacred texts are read or interpreted, that becomes a problem. One of the problems is when fundamentalism becomes the lens through which these sacred texts are read. Now, I said fundamentalism might be a method just to explain it. I think uh, when a religious community uh, view a sacred text in a particular way, it can be described as being fundamental, meaning the back to the sources, back to the original meaning. What's the uh, original meaning of a particular text? So, so then it becomes a fundamental understanding of a sacred text. Uh, the literal interpretation of what the sacred text states. That's a method. But uh, fundamentalism can also become an ideology when uh, people from a particular religious community consider, all right, this is how reality functions. Then fundamentalism describes the lens through which uh, reality is perceived. But then it is much rather a question of um, uh, when a religious community would say everything opposed to our understanding of how reality should look like, something new, something foreign, something uh, outside of our framework, that's considered bad or evil or even destructive, and it should be changed. So fundamentalism becomes... Can I interrupt you a little bit in there? Sure. Um, I know fundamentalism is a serious issue because it's really related to intolerance at high levels. And we've seen this uh, in society and maybe Uganda particularly was focused on the subject of, of, of your homosexuality particularly. And, and, and often in some of these communities, fundamentalism results in, in violence and exclusion and discrimination. And we have seen that too, not only in Uganda, but in other contexts and even uh, some religious communities in South Africa, uh, you know, express such kind of fundamentalism. So, so the question is, how can religious organizations help create a safer and stable environment for people with different sexual orientations? Mm. Now, uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I think once we understand the problem, we might be a step closer to finding an appropriate uh, solution. Uh, I'm not sure whether they are absolute solutions, but at least if we understand what, what causes uh, problems, we might address that. And uh, as to your question, what can religious communities do? I think the moment we consider the matter of fundamentalism to be part of the problem, we can counter that in terms of um, creating an attitude of accepting alternatives. So religious communities can have, uh, can instill this value in a society by saying, we need to be open to alternatives. Fundamentalism is absolutely closed to alternatives. Uh, it's almost as if fundamentalism would say, if you're not for us, you're against us. So uh, what can religious communities do? Exactly the opposite, creating uh, the tolerance or acceptance of alternatives uh, to at least create an awareness of diversity. Uh, and, and I think part of that would be that uh, religious communities instill uh, humility uh, in societies to realize my opinion, my perception, my ideas um, are not the only valid or not the only authoritative uh, ways of perceiving reality. So in this way, it might contribute to how society is uh, expressing values of tolerance uh, in a society. Uh, you, you are also the chair of our teaching and learning committee. So this question is going to be very pertinent for you. Uh, what would you say to the UP community in terms of us preparing our students for workplaces where they, are, where they may face discrimination? What can you be do to actually address that as we prepare students? Thank you. Well, I, I, again, that's not the final solution, but I can contribute to the conversation. And I think one of the things that we need to do is at least, once again, uh, be realistic. And with realism, I'm trying to say we need to realize we will be unable to eradicate discrimination. So we can only uh, treat discrimination in a responsible way. And I think that we need to uh, instill in our students as well. Be aware of the possibility of discrimination. Uh, we will be unable in our lifetimes to, to eradicate discrimination. But what we can do is at least create forums for discussion where our students can talk about the matter. The moment we talk about it, it is in the open. Uh, 
and then at least we become aware of issues. Um, I, I think I like to compare it to, to lightning, when lightning strikes. I mean, we all can predict when lightning is uh, about to strike. We see dark clouds, we hear thunder, so we know lightning is about to strike. And, and I think these matters of discrimination might be just like lightning. We all can see the conditions conducive to discrimination, but we're not 100% sure when, when it will happen. But when we create forums of dialogue and discussion, we might be able to diffuse such tension situations. Skills and forums to use to be able to prepare students for the workplace for discrimination possibilities. I think that's a very good idea. It will have to develop with time. So let's get back to the Bible. I just want to move to the Bible quickly and I'm going to turn to an Old Testament scholar, uh, Professor Yasmeyer. Uh, with, with the Department of Old Testament and Hebrew Scriptures. Uh, so yes, uh, when it comes to discrimination, is the Bible part of the problem or part of the solution? Uh, thank you, Mr. Dean. Um, well, the simple answer is, in a sense, it's both, but I would just like to briefly unpack that uh, so that I think we're all more or less on the same page. Um, I, I think that... The, we need to be honest about, let's call it due to a lack of a better term, the dark sides of the biblical text. And I think one of the most outstanding um, dark sides of the biblical text is that it is deeply patriarchal. And we've touched on this, and Tanya has spoken about these binary definitions, but um, the best example being the Ten Commandments, with the last commandment saying, you shall not um, cover the possessions of another person, of another man, and listed amongst these possessions uh, you would find another person's wife so even even um, the article that um, i wrote here was about uh, those two texts in leviticus 18 and 20 which talk about a man sleeping with a man but all exegetes agree that one of the crucial issues there is a man playing a role of a woman and in a deeply patriarchal society, that doesn't work, and that creates a lot of anxiety amongst men where roles are supposed to be determined and clear-cut and should stay in place. So, so, so the biblical text is very patriarchal, despite the fact that all of you, have, many of you have referred to the priestly creation narrative, despite the fact that the priestly creation narrative actually says that the image of God is male and female. But okay, that's a topic for another day. Other problems with the Bible is the issue of slavery. The Bible is not against slavery. There is a certain development, for instance, in the Pentateuch, but it took the church 1800 years more or less to figure out that slavery, in a sense, contradicts the gospel, it does not go um, with the gospel. There's the issue of violence in the biblical text, especially in books like Joshua. There is the larger debate about eco-theology. I, I saw a question there. Somebody asked a question about that, about the Bible and Christianity being complicit in the destruction of our earth. And once again, the priestly creation narrative says that the earth needs to be filled. But modern day science tells us that the earth is already full. So um, these are the dark sides of the biblical text. The other sides of the biblical text where the, where the text becomes part of the solution is those texts which surprise us. And, and I think I will mention some of those examples in response to, um, to some of the other questions. But human beings made in the image of God being both male and female. And, and many texts pointed out by feminist critics, by black theologians, etc., etc., which in the ancient context was very liberating and, and started to take steps um, away from discrimination to a kind of ethics that we can, we can agree to. Okay, that's my response to the first question. Thank you. Now, I know that one of the things that you've been focusing on in your studies as well, or research rather, is actually the, the biblical concept of holiness. And, and I, I, I wonder, is the biblical understanding of holiness as distinct, separate, and set apart in the world not a recipe for exclusion and discrimination? So how can a critical study of the scriptures help us to understand such concepts? Well, once again, a short answer to your question would be yes, but let me just explain a bit more. If, if you take the book of Leviticus, for instance, and I know nobody reads this unless they 
uh, struggle with sleeping at night. Uh, it's a good way to get to sleep to read Leviticus. But but there's a bigger academic debate in Leviticus about the concept of holiness. Uh, up to Leviticus one to sixteen, the holiness is is defined in terms of the cult. The cult is a holy place. The priests who work in the cult, the personnel of the cult, they are holy. The utensils of the cult, all of these things are holy. And then in the second half of Leviticus, you have this broadening of horizons, what some people would call a democratization of holiness, which is a bit anachronistic, but they use the term where ordinary Israelites are, um, are called upon to become holy. And the way of becoming holy is by performing certain ethical deeds. Uh, holiness then be as an ethical content. Um, you, I, I, will, I will point you a few examples in a moment. So now, Many people get excited about this, but there are two problems with, we should not get too excited about this. Number one, it's clear that although only Israelites are now invited to become holy or challenged to become holy, they aren't really holy and they are not on the same level as priests. And the other bigger problem is still that this is an inner Israel discussion. It's still just something which takes place within Israel and there isn't much space for other people around. Now, I just want to read to you from the Paranetic Frame of the Holiness Code a few texts, a few of just five verses, which I, I think explains the, the problem here. It's Leviticus 20, verses 22 to 26. You shall keep all my statutes and all my ordinances and observe them so that the land to which I bring you to settle in may not vomit you out. You shall not follow the practices of the nation that I am driving out before you, because they did all these things, I abhorred them. So this is actually a case of othering, which is another topic, but it's also related to boundary drawing. The other people were bad, now you get their land, etc., etc. But I've said to you, you shall inherit their land, and I will give it to you to possess a land flowing with milk and honey. I'm the Lord your God. I have separated you from the peoples. There we get closer to the definition and the problem of holiness. You shall therefore make a distinction between the clean animal and the unclean, and between the unclean bird and the clean. You shall not bring abomination on yourself by animal or by bird or anything with which the ground teems, which I have set apart for you to hold unclean. You shall be holy to me, for I, the Lord, am holy. I have separated you from the peoples to be mine. So um, just, just one historical insight from the Persian period where, where we think these texts were produced. Um, where other empires before the Persians were very violent, the Persians presented themselves in a much more peaceful fashion, and they allowed ancient Israel or ancient Judah to rebuild the temple. And, and I see this call for holiness and this call to ethical living as within the context of the larger Persian Empire. And their biggest problem was to maintain their identity. And how did they maintain their identity? They maintained their identity by drawing boundaries, by practicing, as we just saw here, by practicing the Sabbath, by practicing circumcision. All of these things became part of the quest for holiness. And holiness was the two means of which ancient Judeans, which at a later stage we start calling Jews, by means of which they survived this empire. And weaknesses, the problems with that, the boundary drawing, this, this obsession with boundaries. But, but the problem is, if they have not done that, um, Judaism would not have survived, and Christianity would never have been, and Islam would never have been. So, so, so this is the complexity of, um, I think you said before, Mr. Dean, that um, discrimination and maintenance of identity, these are in a sense like two sides of the same coin. And, um, and, and that's also the problem that we have here in this text. But okay, I think that is enough said. Well, I'm glad that you've actually unpacked this uh, concept of holiness because I think it's a very important uh, discussion from a biblical point of view, because there's a lot of church traditions so, uh, uh, that tend to use this idea of holiness to discriminate by defining who's holy, what is holy, and what is not. And in that sense, we actually build boundaries and barriers, and we exclude people, and it creates a lot of tension and problems in accepting and recognizing people created in the image of God. Uh, but let's uh, ask you one final question in this, in this section. 
Uh, many, so lots of people say, should we bother with ancient understandings of morality? Is our modern day understanding of morality not sufficient? And are we not going to a new place? And in some senses, the Bible, for example, or even other religious scriptural texts are not necessarily seen as relevant in terms of understanding moral development in the new world that is changing. How would you respond to that? Um, I think, number one, one should say that the reality is that the Bible as an ancient text or ancient text is authoritative for billions of people. Christianity is a reality. Judaism is a reality, while it's a much smaller reality. And Islam also, in a sense, is there still, which overlaps uh, to a certain extent with us. So there's this reality of billions of people who are people of who accept these texts as authoritative. So, so they're not going to go away. That, that's the reality. So the, even if Western society, to a sense, is secularizing, religion will still very much be with us. So, so we cannot just wish these texts away. A lot of people draw on them, and we need to face these texts. And, and as academics, the only thing we can do is to engage with them critically, which that means to, to face their dark sides, not to try to pretty them up, but on the other side also to try to understand them. And, and I think this is this has helped me in a sense with my own engagement with Leviticus. At times I understand Leviticus as parts of it as an example of what we should not be, as an example of um, of the kind of example we should not follow. At other times it surprises you. Remember also in Leviticus 19, for instance, you have, you should love your neighbor as yourself, so it's a quoted by Jesus in the New Testament, but you also have love the stranger as yourself. So ancient texts are part of our reality. We need to deal with them. We cannot wish them away. And on the other hand, also, when we as modern day human beings say that we know better about everything, that also bears witness to a kind of hubris that I think we should also be careful with today. So, so, so the Bible is part of the reality. It is an ancient text. Um, we need to engage with it critically. And if we do that, at times, we the Bible surprises us. We can see developments in the text. We can see steps in the right direction. Um, and there is still a lot of to be learned from the biblical text. No, sure. Thank you very much. And I think I think your point is that the religious texts uh, are yet to stay. But I think what is important is how we actually interpret them in a changing world and how do we understand them as faith seeks understanding. Um, thank you so much for your input. I want to now move a little bit to a different kind of uh, uh, focus, and that is discrimination through language. And I want to um, speak a little with uh, Professor Ananda as a Oshé, who is also an Old Testament scholar and, um, and obviously uh, specializes in language, and more particularly, obviously, the Hebrew language. And uh, I just want to put one or two questions to her with regards to the use of language. Ananda, uh, how is language used to discriminate? Um, thank you, Chair. Um, let me first start by saying that if I talk about language, I don't firstly mean something like English, Zulu, or Sepedi, but rather the way that we speak, the way we write and the way we communicate. So language can be used to empower or to disempower. It can, it can be used to exclude or to include. According to the postmodern literary theories of philosophers such as Lyotard, Vukov, and Bordeaux, language is not only a system for communicating, but also an instrument of power. A person's relational position in a field or social space determines his or her language. For example, a certain accent can reveal someone's origin. This means that the relevant social paradigm determines whose opinion is accepted as reliable, who can be listened to, who might ask questions, and who might not. Every utterance in a language game should be understood as a move with or against other players. And these language games are always rooted in matters of power. This leads to exclusive language. It is important to know that exclusive language is not always added speech or of an emphatic nature, but can also lie in what has not been said. Exclusive language can often be seen in what is underplayed or what is clearly left out of a narration. 
the words that we choose or don't choose can be discriminating. Therefore, something like exclusive language is definitely discriminating. I really like the focus in terms of the broadness of understanding language, not just to a specific uh, language in terms of the usage to communicate. And I think that's actually very good in terms of its broadness. But also, if we look at language in terms of how it has been used and more particularly used to discriminate, even in the South African context, we are mindful of that. We are mindful of Afrikaans, um, how it is used and has been used in the apartheid time. And even now, the need to still continue to keep Afrikaans on the table. Uh, and people are asking the questions about, what about the other, level, uh, other 10 languages in South Africa? Where, where do they get preference? And we're asking the same problem and question in, in, in the university at, at UP. We have Afrikaans, English, and Sepedi, uh, but there are other people who come with different languages. But I just want to use that broad background in terms of, say, the UP community to ask this question. So why do people use uh, exclusive language? And if we can relate that maybe to some, some uh, indications from the Old Testament uh, to show us some of these kind of approaches to exclusive use. Um, sure, exclusive language is the discourse that um, people used in certain circumstances to strengthen a certain group's identity and to empower it, like Sias has mentioned earlier, um, to legitimize the group's conduct, the behavior and the claims, and in the process, they exclude other groups. This concept of exclusive language or power discourses that was given a name by postmodern philosophers has been used almost spontaneously for all ages. We can say that it's nearly part of being human. History also shows that wherever people find themselves in a position of power, they tend to abuse that power. Concerning the Old Testament, exclusive language has been used in some Old Testament texts to create identity, but in the process, it also ex excluded others. Several Old Testament studies have been conducted concerning identity finding in Israel. Yonker refers to it as an ongoing identity negotiation process, and it applies specifically to texts originated in the context of transition, such as the post-exilic period under the Persian rule in Yehud. Israel needed to find an identity after the exile to this extent that they had to rely on their collective memory. Before the exile, the identity was unproblematic because Judah had a kingdom. Most of the studies about Judah's identity finding in the Second Temple era revealed that the nation was confused and in disarray after the exile. By this, this distancing itself from the other, whether the other indicated other nations or other ideologies or sects within Judaism, they attempted to create an identity for themselves. This period was a time when a nation with diverse ideologies was seeking identity. Most sought it by using yeah. exclusive language. Very few attempted it by using inclusive language. All the same books like One and Two Chronicles, Ezra and Nehemiah are examples of books which have used exclusive language. I really, I really like what you said because I think uh, you've actually put the, uh, the finger on the pulse here when we talk about the language has been used to create identity. Uh, I think that's a very powerful one because if we look at our country, we look at the world at large and our language uh, is used in terms of power equations, but also in terms of identity, because if you take away my language, you take away my identity and, and it's been used uh, on par in many, many instances. So I really like the, the integration of those notions in terms of understanding the dynamic of language uh, and how its how relations are used in terms of identity creation. So if I could ask you another question then, is there something that we can get from the Old Testament to address discrimination through power, game, uh, power games in language? Um, yes, I will say yes. I'll, let me just explain. Um, Israel's universal exclusivity, like we said, was mostly about the preservation of the Israelite identity. We also find inclusive texts in the Old Testament, which are acting as contra texts against the master narrative. Inclusive Old Testament texts protest against the universal exclusivity of Israelite identity. The book of Ruth, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, Deuteronomy, Isaiah, as well as Malachi, are books that can be seen as inclusive 
Also, the other in the book of Jonah is the city of Nineveh. This book has a very inclusive tone where power was exclusively left to Yahweh. Inclusive texts were not only the minority, but they seem to be contra texts, polemically directed against the major texts that were interspersed with exclusive language. Now we can ask what should be done to be truly democratic without discrimination and what kind of language should be used? How can a truly democratic identity be created in a country of diversity? I will propose that an inclusive discourse might be the only way to contra contradict exclusive language and discrimination. Inclusive language is full of respect. An inclusive discourse says that everyone is accepted with his or her own background through mutual respect and no harm to one another. This respect is empowering without being overpowering. It gives equal opportunities and respect without attempting to equalize. Everyone's identity must be cherished and embraced in a mosaic of diversity without trying to force a certain culture or behavior onto another. The basic requisition for mutual respect is to respect and to value the fact that everyone has an opinion which creates a rich mosaic of differences. It goes beyond mere acknowledgement of differences. It is treating the differences with respect, not trying to level away all differences. Van den Wogen says that these are actions of religious people derived from a living relationship with the living God, and that these people live differently and therefore speak differently. He says that a new life entails a new language gain. I really like that because I think the idea of the inclusive discourse and mutual respect are just so powerful, powerful in the description of how we can work with one another and not discriminate in terms of the language and the usage of language. And when I think particularly of the Old Testament and when I think about God's special relationship with the Hebrew community, uh, I always had before me this picture of the past pro toto from the one to the many. And I think sometimes we do not understand it because we think it's only at the one and it remains at the one. It doesn't remain at the one. God chose the one so that the one could be used to reach the many. And, and sometimes I think we forget that. So our language is not just intended to actually keep us exclusive and, and exclude others, but our language is a source of communication to open the doors of communicating with other people, mutually respecting their languages. Thank you for that very incisive input into, into this idea of discrimination through language. I want Thank to you. move then to our final uh, respondent in terms of questions. And this is uh, Professor Christo Lombard, who is the head of department of practical theology and mission studies uh, in our faculty. And he's been doing some exclusive uh, and very powerful work, significant work with regards to broader understanding of religion and religious communication and so forth. Um, Christo, if I could put this question to you. UP is a microcosm of the faith diversities we have in South Africa or even in Africa for that matter. How would you assess the discrimination between faith communities in our country and context? Um, three points, I think. Let me just make sure my sound is Correct on it is on. Uh, You're sounding three, okay. Thank you. Three points, I think. Um, if we mean by discrimination, as you used it here, not distinction, but unfair advantage and disadvantage, I think we're doing well in the sense that there is a strong public consensus that unfair treatment is simply unwelcome. Of course, mm -hmm. unfair advantage and disadvantage on the basis of faith does happen, but not on any grand scale, orchestrated in some national way. Um, that is number one, but number two is there's also a natural sense in which uh, birds of a feather cooperate, often referred to as social capital, on religious matters as spiritual capital, which is the simple sharing of resources. And this happens in any group setting, year two, as we are sharing our intellectual capital. Um, and that's a natural kind of thing that happens. Number three, in all matters of religion, as in all matters of politics or economic policy, or in taste of wine or food, 
people assume my way of doing things is indeed somehow the right way um, or uh, is in some way better than others. Um, implying that other ways are in some manner not as worthy and that is fine. The mature way is for us to live together well is, while, uh, is to do this while you think I am mistaken and that I am okay with it. Uh, if you from religion X think that I from religion Y simply got things wrong, that's okay. With the open possibilities then of living well in parallels, but also in intersections. With the possibilities of cooperation and contestation and conversion and aversion, which are not all equally easy for us to speak about uh, and to live. And broadly speaking, we're coping quite well uh, with that complexity that we live in. I just muted my microphone. Um, absolutely true. I mean, I mean, I think you bring in an idea of how religions can work together. I mean, even at UP, we've been receiving, we've been having some challenges in recent times, and we've been having a conversation about about equal understanding and treatment and respect for religions. And one of the things that actually emerged is the old issue of holy days and uh, and celebrations in terms of of religions. And, and, and the conversation is still taking place as far as that is concerned. But the idea is that we need to show more respect uh, and mutually uh, uh, old in significance. Uh, other religions, apart from Christianity, for example, because Christianity is, is big in the country, but it's also maybe big at UP. And, and how do we actually work with Christian calendar uh, celebrations and not actually uh, be mindful of acknowledging other religions as well in the same space. I'm, let unaware, me move to... figures, I'm unaware of the figures at UP uh, in particular, but nationally Christianity is 83% and rising. You wouldn't say that if you look at the crime and the uh, corruption in the country, uh, but these are people's <laughs> health. <self -identified. laughs> well, we've got a question about, we've got a question those type of Christians, right? <laughs> but often institutions, even such as UP, attempt to take a neutral position uh, mm -hmm. when it comes to religions. And even the state, for example, uh, normally says we are neutral when it comes to religion. So what, what is your view about this? If we, if by neutral we mean religiously diverse and avowedly so, then neutrality is a position we take which incorporates all the mainstream positions of faith on faith, including also atheism. As it's, and its more extreme forms of anti-religious orientations. However, sometime after the French and US constitutions, not in them, but sometimes after them, after these constitutions, which form the reference point of all democ democratic societies since then. And these initial ideas of the separation of state and church came to be reinterpreted so that it is now often understood that in democracies, public spheres should be atheist, understood as religion free and referred to as secular. And this for the sake of a healthy society. And that is the normal understanding um, or the impl implicit understanding. Not understanding somehow that atheism is as much a religious orientation as any other. Uh, that means in the same way as objectivity in scholarship or in journalism, etc., does not exist, but it's a blanket phrase that veils the own commitments. Public atheism uses the term secularism as a veil, presenting a facade of sorts uh, that, uh, uh, that it itself is not a position of faith on faith. Without self-insight, a secular orientation as public atheism does not acknowledge its own religiosity, uh, which is quite forcefully imposed and in a very intolerant manner. Try walking down the Champs Elysees with Muslim head coverings and see what the French police have to say about that. As an extreme example, 
But nevertheless, an example um, in one of what is regarded one of the model democracies of publicly enforced atheism. Yet this is how the political logic has developed in democracies, that public atheism has to be paid homage to, even in the face of all evidence to the contrary. For instance, you can have an American president declaring war on Iraq, giving as reason in 2005 that God told him so. Now, this is America, almost complete separation between church and state. The South African constitution, which you just referred to, understands itself to be secular, but is by no means a religious, um, and in many of its articles. Also with the preamble, including what has been called a rhetorical petition prayer in six languages. The honest truth is that the human condition is multi-confessional, which includes atheist confessions, which is fully in order. But my plea is for honesty, that we do not mask one thing by calling it another. In the same way as an asexual personal orientation is not a position from beyond sexualities that takes forms of sexuality into review. In the same way, public atheism or secularism is not a view from beyond religiosities. We are all implicated, we are all religious. This is a very difficult position for committed secularists to accept that their self-understood position of being beyond religiosities is in fact itself a position of faith on faith. There is no beyond position. The same as with economics, as Karl Marx showed us, and with sexuality, as Freud has showed us, and power, as Nietzsche and Foucault have shown us, the human condition is simply such that we are committed in these respects. So my plea is rather than veil our orientation, or veil a university's orientation, or veil a country's orientation, be honest about it. We have been outed in all these respects. So that's very interesting because it brings the issue of neutral into question uh, in terms of how we define ourselves and like to categorize ourselves in approaching matters of religion. Uh, but uh, to, to draw a little bit deeper into what you're just saying, uh, in, your, in your paper that I read and not everybody else has, uh, you make a particular formulation where you say a faith-free position runs parallel to saying that one speaks without an accent. Hmm. I know you've been talking about that now, but could you just deepen yes. that a little bit for us? Yes. What I try to say with this is that we all know the, the nonsense thing which we find in, uh, in movies and in uh, literature, that somebody would say, I will teach you the English language because I, I speak it without an accent. And of course, you realize immediately that's complete nonsense. There's no such thing of speaking without an accent. And the same thing with the, uh, the faith-free position, the, the so-called secularist position. It presents itself as being free of faith, but it is not. It is simply public mm -hmm. atheism, which of course is fine. I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but it is dishonest to, pre pre to pretend that public atheism is free of religion. It is not. It has very firm religious commitments um, and, and requires actions and requires beliefs almost a little bit like the religio licita in the uh, uh, early uh, Christian centuries, in the early years BCE, um, that Judaism was regarded as a special kind of religion um, as, uh, by the state. As long as you conform to what is the public sentiments, then, then you can go ahead with yourself. And for instance, that is why early Christianity was per persecuted. Not because there's something subversive, not only because there's something subversive about the faith, but you had to pay homage to the Caesar as well, which Christianity couldn't do. Um, and, and as long as you did that, you could do anything else religiously, that would be fine. But Christianity couldn't do that one thing. So the public sentiments made it impossible for Christians to be accepted in the society. And that's that kind of thinking that you have to pay public homage to this kind of thinking and whatever else you then do is fine in private or outside of the public sphere. Um, that same kind of position has been taken by this, uh, this idea of secularism, that you have to pay homage to this, you have to say this, 
if you want to get ahead in business, in academia, um, in politics, certainly, you have to mouth these truths, even though clearly uh, secularism itself is atheism, which is a um, form of uh, religion. And even though there, there's no pure form of it anywhere in the world, it's, it's never worked. Um, even in France, the example that I gave in the USA, which are the two most uh, adamant uh, societies uh, in separating church and state, it really does not exist. I mean, absolutely. I think I think one of the important things you know, in understanding, and my understanding particularly, is that the major religions in the world, I mean, I would think this to be true of all religions, uh, proclaim peace. Religions are supposed to be advocating peace, uh, uh, shalom, and, and, and so forth in terms of, you know, how we respond to the world and all the different things that we are facing in the world. But unfortunately, discrimination, intolerance, fundamentalism have actually taken the front seat. And what we have is also religiously inspired violence uh, in the world, not so much in South Africa, but in other parts of the world, it is a huge problem. And my own take on this is that these kind of violences are not actually inspired by, by religious beliefs per se, in as much as it is by political inclinations, economic aspirations, and aspirations to actually take over the world. So I think these yeah. are the realities that actually make good religion, peaceful religions, become militant by, by a few. <laughs> The, the classic example of that, uh, the, the classic retort to this argument that religions bring war is, of course, the Soviet Union, one of the biggest empires the world has ever known, and one of the cruelest, and formerly atheist, um, with one or two exceptions, such as Poland. If you had any religious commitment, you limited your life possibilities rather seriously. Um, yet, look what they did. Um, it was certainly no love thy neighbor kind of ethic, and they didn't require religion for that. So there's a very good example. We have a formally, a confessionally non-religious society and doing terrible things to people, their own people as much as to other people. You don't require religion to be evil, which is kind of the implication that people often have. Neither is, no. is religion a good predictor of not being evil, because we know that too with the uncomfortable example of that uh, always of uh, serial murderers often being highly religious people in a very strange way, in a very particular way, mm. with no compassion. Um, so being religious or, or, or non-religious is not a good predictor about for violence or non-violence. These two, two things do not have a one-to-one -one correlation. Of course, as a Christian and a pacifist, I think they should be, but that's just me. <laughs> Thank you so much, um, uh, Christoph, for speaking to us about faith uh, diversity. And I think this is actually a good conclusion to other contributions from our different respondents to the questions. We're now going to go into some time of questions. And I do know the chat box has been a bit busy with this. So I see one that has caught my eye al almost immediately. And this is directed to Shulani. Shulani, I hope you're still there. Um, how does Black liberation theology relate to the eco-theological stance pertaining to balance of all life in terms of creation and restoration. Uh, well, down to the... All right, you go ahead. I think right. you've, seen the, you've seen the question. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think one thing for sure is that liberation theology has made the connection that the destruction in particular, let me talk about Africa, the destruction of people's human beings or their humanity is interrelated with the destruction or the confiscation of the land and so forth. And ultimately there is that economic logic of big business and the whole, uh, and those whole issues that then map up the sort of ecological crisis that we find into the predicament that human beings find themselves in is due to those, to those factors. So I think ultimately we are attempting to push it to that level and deal with things like eco theology and so forth. But we don't want to make the assumption or I don't want to make the assumption that we got where we are within our ecological crisis without pinpointing the historical development that led us there. So I think in as much as there's a cry to sort of affirm the humanity of others, there is also a cry that within our affirmation, we also take the whole of creation with us uh, at the same time. Thank you to for the project. question. Thank you. Thank you, Shulani. Uh, uh, Lorato has responded by saying with regards to Black liberation theology is not a single event and therefore it can never be relevant 
Uh, and I think that reaffirms the point that you've actually made with regards to the significance of black theology of liberation uh, in the current dispensation and even in times to come. Um, I see a question, racism exists at individual systemic institutional and cultural levels. How would black theology add value in these levels in challenging racial ideologies? That question I see comes from my brother, Professor Jace Pillay. Thank you for that question. <laughs> well, I, I think ultimately, in order for, 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 for one to have that individual um, sort of like racial or racist uh, outlook and so forth, it has to largely do with the fact that uh, you are situated in a position of power. Uh, you are able to do so because power will allow you to do so. That is why it's always that debate as to whether blacks can be racist or not. Of course, one can make assertions about racial slurs and so forth. But if we understand, at least within the, par the paradigm of black liberation theology, that ultimately racism is underpinned by the economic logic that sort of wants to benefit one particular race to another, it will be very difficult for us to deal with those, uh, what you call it, exceptions of racism without dealing with the concrete reality of racism, which entails dealing with the system itself. Thank you. I see the next question is for Professor Fanek. Ethnicity for blackness uh, is a site of negation because it assumes social death, doesn't it? Uh, did you get that question? Uh, uh, Chair, I, I got that question. Uh, thank you for the question. And I, I, I want to be very clear first that I'm not saying there's, there's no such thing as racism. And secondly, I do not see ethnicity as a cop out for racism. That's, that's not my point of view. My point of view is the following, that in antiquity, there was not a category what we know as a race. If someone was dark skinned or light skinned, it was argued, it's because that person was in the sun or that other person was not in the sun. So, and it was one of the aspects people used to delineate peoples from one another. Now, my argument is, if we now go and we take one aspect, only skin color, that in essence leads to discrimination. It leads to uh, racism much easier because we stereotype people mainly because on the basis of their skin color. But if you look at someone in terms of the whole person, language, place of birth, coming from religion, culture, and so forth, I think it's a more balanced way in, 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 relate, in, in, in relating with people. But I want to be very clear, I do not see ethnicity as a cop out for racism. That's not what I'm arguing. Sure. I see a line to that is another question. And that is, don't you think that the focus on ethnicity undermines the focus of racism, which in South Africa is a black white concern? That is, a, that, that is exactly my point. One can see it from that perspective, but I believe because we only focus on skin color, that is a cause for racism. It, it, it makes us stereotyping people in a very, very easy way, which is so wrong. But if you look at it in a broader way, then maybe it can curb racism in a certain sense. Thank you. I see another question or point or comment is from on the basis of culture and Glynis uh, Goins, I'm wondering from my very ignorant standpoint where the cultural differences pertaining to marriage, especially the Labola system between different um, tribal, I'm sorry, I'm just seeming to lose that on my, uh, between different um, tribal groups. I uh, can't seem to get the rest of the question. Let me just, uh, sorry, I've lost that. Um, Shulani, I wonder if you could pick up the question. I, I can't seem to pick it up again. It focuses on, on Labola. Let me try. Did you get that question? No, let me check it out. Okay, let's just, uh, Glynis Goins, if you're still with can us, I, would you like I to give pose it, the question? Can I give it to you verbally? Um, oh, yes, yeah. please, yes. Please the, do that. The, the, I'm wondering from my ignorance standpoint whether cultural differences pertaining to marriage, especially the Labola system between different tribal groups, result in practical experiences of discrimination within that scenario and how liberation theology would address such issues. Okay. 
Well, I think the truth of the matter is that there is work that has already been done, uh, particularly by um, womanist theologians as well as feminist theology that ultimately, I don't think liberation, black liberation in theology in particular operates from the premise that even our custom and culture are actually uh, supreme. In one way or another, we are also critical of some of those uh, issues that might pertain to violation or some kind of negation of one's human right or so forth. So there is work that has been done in terms of that. But I think ultimately we are looking for a possibility of a much more practical approach to dealing with those specific issues and those specific, uh, what you call it, problems that we encounter around those things. But ultimately we, we have to sort of struggle between and this is where African theology comes in, where we have to struggle with African culture, African history, and so forth, in order for us to map up what exactly is it that we conceive for the future and how do we think we'll actually get there to the future. I hope this does try to answer you to a certain extent. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Tanya van Weyck. Thank you, Dean Pilo. I just thought, uh, because this is a platform for conversation, I'd just like to quickly just play into uh, the question that Glynis has presented us with and uh, my colleague Shulani has answered, because indeed uh, the question that she posed is uh, exists on multiple levels. And of course, once you start to talk about marriage and labola, I think uh, issues of uh, gender norms and gender roles as it pertains to culture and religion plays directly into this. And I think Shulani has just briefly mentioned that. And in this regard, I just want to briefly mention the work by um, the theologian Edwin Zulu, um, in which he actually is critical towards the role of culture. And I think that is something in, in today's discussion that we also can pay some attention to. Uh, his, his contribution is titled, um, it's, it's was published in an edited volume, but the specific contribution is uh, masks and the men behind them unmasking culturally sanctioned gender inequality. And he makes quite a bit of interesting statements about how culture can be a vehicle to create new symbols and new language and new rituals, but it can also be a mask behind uh, which one hides. And I think a faculty like ours in religion uh, can in that cooperation be able to deconstruct and unmask these type of things, exactly what Glynis and Shalani refer to. So I just wanted to um, come in in this part of the conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, Lorato, I want to give you an opportunity. I know that you've said a few things and you've asked uh, one or two questions. I I'm seemingly having a problem with my chat box. Uh, would you like to pose a question or two or make a comment, uh, Lorato? Um, thank you, Dean. Am I audible? Yes, I can hear you. Um, no, I, I perhaps I just wanted to add on to what uh, Shulani was saying about uh, the continuity and the utility of black liberation theology. And I guess I just made a few comments in the chat box that I don't believe that it's, it's a single event uh, because when we look at uh, racism and its functions as both a, a superstructure and infrastructure, then these asymmetrical relations will continue. And I guess this is why I'm against the use of um, ethnicity as a host antagonism. Rata, we seem to lose you muted again. Are you done or? Okay, oh, we yes, I'm, yes, I'm done, oh, Dean, sorry. thank you. Thank you, I'm done. Thank okay, you. thank you very much. Thanks for that input. I just want to check with um, uh, Bushla and Pofo. I know that you had a few comments as well. Again, I'm, I can't quite pick it up. Is there a point you'd like to make or a question or two that you'd like to ask? Thanks. I needed to just check whether it would be an appropriate way of articulating uh, some of the points that came up especially in relation to what Lerato just spoke to, the superstructures with regards to class, race, and ethnicity, and whether understanding such uh, patterns of marginalities, I've put them there in the light of bell hooks, uh, could be helpful uh, in appropriating the relevance of such marginality as a space or a site 
for resistance. Thank you. So this Thank was just much. to. This was just to check whether it would be an appropriate approach, uh, especially in light of what they've presented. But also just a quick one uh, in terms of black liberation and eco-theology. And I think what I appreciate uh, about reappropriating the role of black re liberation in the context of uh, giving space for the previously sidelined uh, epistemologies uh, within the African indigenous knowledge system is that I have considered the African worldview to be a potentially constructive eco-theology in that our African communal sense of relating to one another and with nature helps us to appreciate that we should not exploit nature in the environment. And in one publication, I've actually uh, put forward a thesis to say, nature is being violent to us because we have been violent with nature. I, I think your point with regards to the African worldview is very, very important uh, because there's so much more to learn and to discover using that approach. Epistemology is a very important thing in terms of, of learning and discovering. And we have not done much from an African perspective. So I think your point is very well taken there. And we need to do more exploration as far as that is concerned. I just want to give it an open time now. If there's anybody who'd like to ask a question, you can raise your hand or you can put on your microphone and, and pose your question. Um, delay while people are deciding whether or not they'd like to share or comment or pose a question, I'd just like to remind the group as we're nearing the end of our time together at half past two, that the recording of this meeting will be available on the faculty website either from tomorrow or the following day. If you'd like to share the file link with those uh, in your spheres of influence that might find the discussion relevant and interesting, you can go to the Faculty of Theology and Religion website uh, within the UP website and find the link in our video section. And uh, please do feel free to share it uh, widely and also to continue the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. Christo? Thank you, colleagues. Um, a theological question. The one concept that has circulated here a few times and which is often used in discussions about the, these kinds of topics is the Imago Dei, um, the image of God, which exegetes of the Old Testament understand better than uh, theologians from, for instance, systematic theology um, and, uh, and other fields. I mean better, I mean within the context of the ancient Near East. Um, and often this rather limited understanding of what the Imago Dei means, those one or two texts in, in Genesis of Christo, we seem to have lost you. I hope it's not just me. Christo seems to have frozen. Uh, for the sake of time, which coming to, to an end almost, uh, maybe is there somebody else wants to jump, jump in in the meantime? No, I'll, I'll be, um, I'll chair. Yes, please, Zoro. Yes, uh, thank you so much. Um, sorry that uh, we couldn't have for the, the final comment mm -hmm. of the last speaker, but but I think I wanted to come in. Um, it, it seems like a lot of, of the speakers this afternoon, uh, we seem to zero on or, or finish. Uh, this is my, my general comment that we seem to finish on on the assumption of uh, what we call mutual dialogue or uh, respective uh, dialogue. And, and, and sometimes I find such kind of conclusions. I don't know from my other colleagues within the faculty and also uh, from other disciplines that, that 
um, I, I find that position a little bit troubling because it assumes that there is such a platform of, of mutual dialogue or, 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 or mutual respect. Because for me, I think such kind of a conclusion misses the very variable from which we are starting the discussion of discrimination, which is the problem of power, and the power that produces particular categories and the power that produces particular racial and economic distribution and the power that produces a special uh, distribution in our society. And as a, as a country that comes from um, a very racial divided past, I think that question of dialogue, that question of mutuality needs to be problematized itself to say, who starts the dialogue? Who, who assumes mutual position? Who assumes a um, neutral position of approach? Um, I don't know. I don't have the answer to that. But, but I, I think I think we, we need to be more critical for how power, even us who are in academia, and who are privileged to earn a salary and speak on behalf of those who are in Tempisa, Mamelodi, and in the Sheikh, who perhaps don't have the privilege to voice out uh, some of the. Oh. Injustices. Thank, yeah. thank you. Thank you, Zarel. I think I just want to give one last opportunity to one of the hands that is up. But before that, I think your point is that uh, I think your point is very valid and, and well taken because the question is, even when we come to dialogue, are we all equal at the table? And that's that's a question that needs to be interrogated. Lungil and Pacheni, I'm going to give you the opportunity to ask the final question or comment. Thank you so much, Prof. It's more for a comment. Um, if it's a question, perhaps I think I'll decide at the end. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy for what has happened here today. I just appreciate uh, the contributions that were made by our learned friends from your faculty. Um, my worry is that whenever we speak about these things, it's like in South Africa, we are preaching to the converted, yet we continue to witness these acts of discrimination on a day-to-day -day basis. I am not sure if we are really effective in our approach to transform our societies or we are sugarcoating when we do this. I mean, both in the academia and in the church space where I'm active, I'm always worried that it's like we are not making any meaningful impact to change our society, perhaps those who are in this advocacy need to find ways and means to push harder so that we can make difference. Because if you talk racism, day by day you hear acts of racism, issues of patriarchy, issues of uh, religious fundamentalism, and many others that have been discussed here. So we really want to uh, uh, coordinate efforts uh, that are going to really make meaningful impact and inroads in the communities of our people. Thank you. Thank you, Lungila, for that comment. I think it's a very nice uh, way to actually round up this particular webinar. And you're absolutely right about that. Um, one of the things I was saying to my colleagues is that in, in preparing this and putting it together, and I'm reading the papers in the process of doing that, I just thought it actually stirs and steers a lot of very good conversations. And what I did say to them is that it's all not going to end on a platform like today, that from next year, if the COVID situation changes, uh, that we would actually have con uh, courage courageous conversations where I'm hoping that we will take certain themes that have been explored today and have deeper conversations about these things if we really want to work with and work against uh, discrimination. And I think it's not just an academic exercise. And from what you're saying is, I mean, you also refer to just not only to academia, but even to the church, for example. And I, I just think we've got to work, ask how can we all join together in impacting society and bringing about transformation. So I think we need to find some good ways and collective ways of working together for better social impact. And we will pick up that conversation uh, when we're actually getting back into the discussions of these various topics. So thank you for that input. Uh, in conclusion, uh, folks, we come to the end now. 
Uh, and I just want to say thank you to all the participants, to all the people who have responded to the questions, for your preparations and for your responses. Thank you for the conversation, conversations. Thank you to everybody who have joined us from UP and from outside of UP. We really appreciate your presence. As you know, we've been only able to touch things on a surface level, and there's been quite a bit of uh, impactful discussions, uh, more of a hit and run rather than stop and, 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 and gaze. Uh, into the problem and, and finding ways to address discrimination. But I think if we're just giving you a taste to see the different things that we can approach from a faith uh, uh, perspective, um, at least we can start to know these things and explore these things with time to come. And they're not new things. They've been with us for a while. And we need to ask, as Lungila said, how do we actually really make meaningful change and transformation uh, in South Africa, in, in the communities in which we live, and even beyond. So this conversation will have to continue, but it must continue with practical changes of transformation, and we will do that. So I want to thank all my colleagues for, for the participation. Really appreciate your presence here. I want to thank everybody else for being part of this platform for this full duration of just over two hours. And finally, I'd like to thank, in particular, Professor Mary Crew. Uh, for, for the one who actually incited this entire thing by asking our faculty to be the pilot faculty uh, working on the issue of the anti-discrimination policy of the university and to pilot this program in terms of university setup. And we took up the challenge and, uh, and I'm hoping that these conversations have been good. And so thank you, Mary, for, for initiating this and with the transformation office of the, of the university as well for your role in helping us to facilitate these discussions. Thank you, everybody. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day. And, and really, let's go out there. If we can't change the world, let us each change ourselves, uh, seeking to work against discrimination. And in the process of us doing that, the world around us, hopefully, will change too. Thank you so much. Take care. And God bless. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof.